Please welcome Dr. Christopher Yuan to the stage. We live in a world of infinite shades of gray, not just 50. <laughs> Ambiguity is essentially a virtue. The more vague you are, the better. And sexual freedom is pretty much the religion of the land. And this is the lie that we live today, that your sexual desires define you, determine you, and should always delight you. But since, and since the fall of Adam and Eve, the human heart has set itself in defiance against God's perfect ways. However, this idolatry of sexuality is on a collision course with the gospel, as my life was on a collision course with the gospel. So um, how many of you guys were not here this morning uh, for the Sunday services? Any, anyone here? Oh, there's a good, good amount of you. So you don't know who I am, don't know my story. Well, let me give you some kind of an abbreviated version. Um, and uh, it's, it is also, be, before we, uh, I'm going to talk and, and teach for a little while. I'm going to give a little short part of my testimony. And then we're going to have question and answer afterward. And we'll, we can post this number later, but maybe you can jot this down. If you have a question, and uh, you can shoot that in. I think this goes right to Josh's phone so he can bug him like at midnight. Or, no. <laughs> but we will do a Q&A later. We will have, you can raise your hand, but if you want to do a question more anonymously, feel free to um, jot, the, jot the phone down and you can text the number in. So I wasn't raised in a Christian home, but I wrestled with my sexuality. I didn't come out until my early 20s. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Me coming out to my parents was actually what brought my mother to faith and then my father to faith. I went in the opposite direction. I'm from Chicago. I was going to dental school in Louisville, Kentucky. And at that time, I was doing what all my friends were doing, which was have fun, right? Life is short, have fun. And I was partying. I started doing drugs. I was going out to the clubs. And not all gay men do drugs. Not all gay men are promiscuous. That is part of my story, unfortunately. And I started selling drugs. Eventually, I was expelled from dental school just three months before I was to receive my doctorate. I then moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and I kept doing what I knew how to do best at that time, and that was have fun. I not only was selling drugs, I was supplying drugs. I was, and eventually, I mean, this whole time, my parents had no clue that I was doing drugs, but they knew that my biggest need was not to stop doing drugs or not to start dating girls, but they knew my biggest need was to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they prayed for that miracle. Um, they came to visit me one time in Atlanta. I told them to get out. My dad gave me his Bible before they left and I threw it in the trash can. That's how much I despised religion and God and the Bible. And it was so obvious after that visit that I was totally unreachable and completely hopeless. But I praise the Lord that my parents didn't focus on the hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over 100 prayer words from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mother began to pray a bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. Well, that whatever it takes came with a bang on my door. On my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. They confiscated my money, my drugs. I found myself in jail, a place that I never thought I would find myself. And I uh, walked, a few days after that, I was walking around the cell block, passed by this garbage can, and something on top of the trash caught my eye. Bent over, picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. Took it back to my cell, began reading it. And at first, it wasn't giving me any warm fuzzies. It did not give me all the answers to all my problems. But actually, it began to convict me. And I'm like, I thought this was supposed to be good news. I was like, this is not sounding like good news for me. I'm a really bad person. Well, things got worse. I was called to the nurse's office, and I was told that I was HIV positive. 
A few days after that, I was laying in my bed, looked up at the cold metal bunk above me, and someone had scribbled something, and it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That was the most hopeless point in my life. And God used those words written by a prophet to a rebellious nation, Israel, to tell me that just as he had a plan for a rebellious nation like Israel, he could have a plan for me. But I don't know where that plan was going to take me, but he gave me enough faith to get through that one day and the next and the next. So my transformation was gradual. God convicted me of my dependencies, obviously drugs. But within a few months, God delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing to mind other idols. And there was this one thing that I just felt like I couldn't let go of, my sexuality. This is who I am. I was reading through the Bible, and it was so clear to me God loved me unconditionally. I kept reading, came across these passages, three in the Old Testament, three in the New, that seemed to condemn that core part of who I thought I was, my sexuality. Went to a chaplain because I thought, I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know that much about the Bible. I better ask someone who studied the Bible, who knows about this issue, who's went to cemetery, seminary. <laughs> the chaplain, he's got to know. To my surprise, the chaplain actually told me the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. And he even gave me a book, went to his bookshelf, Got a book, he said, here, this book explains that view. So think about it. With much curiosity, I took that book, hoping to find biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand, the Bible in the other. Everything inside of me, everything wanted to affirm that book. I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming. But I look back and I know it was the miracle of the indwelling Holy Spirit that convicted me that those assertions were a clear distortion of God, his word, and his unmistakable condemnations against same-sex relationships. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain. So I turned to the Bible alone. I went through every verse, every chapter, looking for justification. I mean, I wanted to find any shred of evidence, anything that might give an affirming uh, an, an affirmation for a monogamous same-sex relationship. I went through the whole Bible. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked, I looked, and I couldn't find any. So I was standing at a crossroads. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay, gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship by freeing myself from my sexuality and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I realized my sexuality should not be the core of who I am. I told myself before God loves me unconditionally. That's true. But don't we as sinners like to add to God's truth? I added, so therefore he doesn't want me to change. But I realize that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity should not be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires, whether sexual or romantic. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It is not even heterosexual for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy for I am holy. I thought that if I were to become a Christian, that I must become a heterosexual, which meant the more sexually attracted I were to lots and lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if I had opposite sex attractions, I would still need to flee temptation. I would still need to resist sinful behavior. So actually, heterosexuality may be the right direction, but too broad, too general. And God never commands us, be heterosexual, for I am heterosexual. Neither does he say, be homosexual, for I am homosexual. But God says, be holy, 
for I am holy. So therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That's not the goal. But the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin struggle is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm tempted or whether I'm struggling, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity because change, and this is important, change, biblical, the way that the Bible defines change, change is not the absence of temptations. Jesus Christ himself was tempted in every way but was without sin. Change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit-wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm tempted, not whether I'm struggling, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. I began living in this life of surrender and obedience, and God began to reveal his plan for my, my life, called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison, of all places. And I knew that I needed to learn more about the Bible, so I called them, collected my parents, told them I think God's calling me into ministry, and then I asked them to mail me an application to the only Bible college I had heard of, Moody Bible Institute. They mailed it in to me, I filled it out, and then I realized, the last page, that I needed references. So the only people I was able to convince were a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate. <laughs> Amazingly, God uh, allowed me to be accepted at Moody. I went to Moody. Uh, got out of prison in July of 2001. I was released from prison in July of 2001, and I started the very next month in August of 2001. So imagine, think about it, the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> <laughs> Graduated from Moody in 2005, went after my master's in exegesis, and then got my doctorate of ministry in 2014. And then in 20, uh, 2011, I was able to co-author a book with my mother called, called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. And uh, we wrote it together. She, uh, uh, she wrote chapter one, I wrote chapter two, because we, we really wanted to tell you from our own voice how you can have the same situation told from two totally different perspectives, a parent, a prodigal, and how God and his power and his grace brought us all back together. My newest book is called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, Sex, Design, and Relationships Shaped by God's Grand Story. I think it's so important if we're going to be pushing back against the tsunami of misinformation regarding sexuality, not grounded in a, in a biblical framework, then we need to be able to articulate that well. I think we need more books on a theology of sexuality, uh, and so that was my goal to do that. Um, and, and if you look, uh, the, my, the cover is a little bit kind of not very creative, it's just black and white, but that was intentional. Because we live in gray today, don't we? Everything's gray. I mean, how many different sexual identities are there now? How many genders? I mean, there's, and we live in gray. And I wanted to articulate not only in the book, by also, but also by the cover, that God's, under, God's communication of biblical sexuality is not gray. It's black and white. So how do we understand sexuality? And how are we able to engage with those in the gay community when they don't want to know anything about God? When they want actually just to live their life leave them alone, or just be good people. You know, you hear a lot of people that say, well, we just need to love. Yes. But the issue, I believe, is not that we need to become more loving. The real issue is, what does your love look like? Love is not the opposite of truth. There's a misunderstanding that somehow we have love on one side and truth on the other. That's wrong. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says that love rejoices in the truth. Amen? So actually, you don't have love apart from truth. If your love is not grounded in anything, it ain't love. True love is grounded in truth. And so when people are like, we just need to love, we need to just, you know, do right. 
But if you try to do right without thinking right, you could be doing wrong. So I want us, before we think about how do we love, we need to make sure that we're grounding our love on a foundation of God's truth. Amen? But we actually have a pretty bad reputation when it comes to engaging our friends and loved ones in the gay community. Actually, in general, we have a pretty bad reputation. There's a book that's called Unchristian, written by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. And they asked young Americans, what do you think about Christians? And they asked positive things and negative things. And by far, it was all negative. From the bottom, Christians we are viewed to be confusing, not accepting, boring, insensitive, out of touch, too political, old-fashioned, hypocritical, judgmental. And guess what's at the very top? Anti-homosexual. 91% of those not raised in the church believe that we are anti-homosexual. That's an enormous percentage. But what about our youth and young adults? We teach them, love the sin or hate the sin. According to the survey, eight out of 10 of our own youth and young adults believe that we ourselves are anti-homosexual. And note, it doesn't say anti-homosexuality, kind of more the issue, the topic. But according to the survey, we are viewed to be against gay people. And that is wrong. The gospel is not against anyone. The gospel is for everyone. It's an invitation for all to know and surrender to Christ. And so should we be for all people. But unfortunately, people's perception is their reality. So how do we have a more Christian response, a gospel-centered response, not just to this topic, not just to this topic, but more importantly, to our loved ones and friends in the gay community. If you like my notes, you can scan this QR code. There's going to be a lot of information here if you like that, and then you're taking notes. Uh, I suggest, you know, go ahead and do this, so that way, if you're, there's something that you miss, I might be going a little bit fast, but you can scan this QR code. If you're doing it with your mobile device now, you might be asked to uh, sign up for a Dropbox account if you don't have one already. You don't have to. You can either say, no, thank you, or I don't know, maybe there's an X in the corner and X out of that, and you'll just view my notes. Or if you don't know what a QR code is, that's okay. <laughs> you can just jot down the shortened URL there at the bottom. U Y U A N, the number two dot US slash C R, and you could get the same thing. And actually, you can take that home and view that on your desktop or your laptop. There are many ways to have a Christian response or any type of response. We could, we could be looking at what's going on in government, public policy, and those are important things. Or we could be viewing this maybe as a sociological reality, a developmental disorder. But actually, I think that the best way to have a Christian response is that we begin with the gospel. That we are all sinners, but God sent his son to die for sinners in our place. And by faith, by grace, through faith in Christ, we can be reconciled to God and go from children of wrath to children of God because we now have Christ's righteousness by grace. I think that's a great foundation to begin anything. Amen? I mean, any of our responses, we should be grounded and beginning in the gospel. So I'm going to center my talk around four things. How do we have a gospel-centered Christian response to this very important topic, and how do we engage our loved ones and friends in the gay community? So first thing, before we do anything else, we need to make sure that we have the right attitude. We need to be convicted about our own sin. Unfortunately, Christians, we have more of a reputation of doing this at others when we first need to be doing this at ourselves. When I lived as a gay man years ago, I felt Christians were telling me that somehow gays and lesbians deserved a hotter place in hell. That Jesus had to hang on the cross a little bit longer for gays and lesbians. That's so far from the truth. It's a sin, but it's not the worst sin. And yet sometimes we treat it like the worst sin. 
but it's an abomination. True, it's an abomination. But you know what else the Bible says in abomination? In Proverbs 6, King Solomon says that pride is an abomination. Causing dissension is an abomination. So when was the last time your friend was a little bit prideful and you say, you are abomination? <laughs> Maybe we should. And when we do that, we wouldn't trivialize sin that really grieves God's heart. Or you might know someone who says, well, I can't help it. It's being shoved down our throat and it's all over the place. And I agree with that. But then they continue and say, but, you know, I, I see a gay couple and it just kind of grosses me out. It makes me feel uncomfortable. And I understand that we should not be relishing in sin. But I think that that disgust that sometimes people feel about this particular sin should actually be a reminder for them. Because that feeling that they might have for someone else's sin is really just a fraction of what God feels when he looks at their own sin. And maybe even more. So our sin is just as odious in God's eyes than someone else's sin. I mean, have you noticed how easy it is to be disgusted about someone else's sin? Oh, I can't believe what she's doing. That's so awful. I would never do that. Well, of course you wouldn't because that's not your temptation. That's not your sin struggle. But we don't say the same thing about ours, do we? We should, but we don't. We don't hate our sin. We should hate our sin. Our flesh loves our sin. My good friend Rosaria Butterfield jokes, she says, if your sin doesn't feel good, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> I mean, if we're really, really honest, if we're really, really honest, I mean, we're not showing off, but we're really honest, we would recognize that our sin feels good. That's why it's so tempting, right? I mean, if something didn't feel good, it wouldn't be tempting, right? Like imagine like, like sin was like, you know, a bowl, a bowl of boiled broccoli or, you know, I like broccoli, so I don't know, Brussels sprouts. I like Brussels sprouts either. So I don't know, whatever you guys don't like, you know, something, you know, like, no, 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 that's okay. That's not what sin is. You know, it's like a double chocolate fudge, whatever, Sunday, And, you know, that's like, do you want that? You know, everything inside of you, like, yes. It feels good, but it brings death. And so we're not disgusted about our own sin, and we should be. We're disgusted about other people's sin. But that's not your sin. That's why you're not disgusted about it. Because let me tell you, at the end of the day, what I want more than anything else is that people would know Jesus. Amen? But that's never done through a holier-than-thou attitude. Have you ever met anyone who came to Christ? through someone who's really prideful. Oh, I came to Jesus. You know, this person shared Christ to me. She was so pompous. <laughs> Have you ever heard something like that? A testimony? I've never heard that before. You know, so pride, holier than thou, is not going to share the gospel better. It's humility. It's brokenness. It's conviction. So I think a great place to start before we do that is do this. Let's be convicted about our own sin first because that immediately leads us to humility. I mean, it's cliche, but it's level at the cross. It's level at the cross. And so let's just realize, yes, but by the grace of God, go I. So first, we need to be convicted, leading to humility. Second, we need to be consistent. And consistent in three ways. First of all, regarding relationships. What is your relationship status? Are you married or are you single? And there's such a huge imbalance today between marriage and singleness, where marriage is really, really good and singleness is uh, not so good. You might think, I, I see that imbalance that we have, but what does it have to do with my gay neighbor? What does it have to do with my lesbian cousin? A lot. Because God's word is clearly communicating to us that being in a same-sex relationship is not his will. So our hope for our friends and loved ones is first that they would know Christ and through their faith go and sin no more, which would mean that they wouldn't be in a same-sex relationship, which also would mean that they would be single for a period in their life, if not a longer period in their life. And if so, do we have a healthy place for singles to thrive in Christian community today? I think there's place for improvement. You know, I can understand where the world says that singleness is equated to loneliness, but Christians also think that as well. We think that being single is unfair. Being single means that you're going to be alone and lonely for the rest of your life. But there's a difference between being single and being lonely. And you know why I can say that? You know why I can say that singleness is not equivalent to loneliness? Because actually, I know some people who are married, and they're still miserably lonely. 
So marriage actually is not the cure to loneliness. You know what's a cure to loneliness? It begins with a relationship with God. That's a cure to loneliness, not another person. Don't ever treat your spouse or your future spouse as the one who will meet all your needs. That's too much pressure on one person that that person can never meet. Only God is the one who can meet all our needs. Amen? Amen. Your spouse is not your Messiah. There's only one Messiah, and his name is Jesus. So we need to realize, but that's such a big part of our culture. You know, I went to Moody Moody Bridal Institute. It was culture shock when I got to campus. You know, I loved, I mean, the Christian community, but like when I saw people and how they dated, I was like, what are you guys doing? You know, first date, we're like, we got to see if we're compatible. You know what I mean? So how many kids do you want? Like, you know, you want to, you know, and, and I understand like, you want to go to the mission field? You want to be a pastor? You know, like getting, you know, but it's like, maybe get their name first. You know, I mean, <laughs> You know, the Beck's pickup line at Moody was, let's share testimonies. <laughs> I just was like, it was just all so new to me. I don't know what was going on. You know, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying at all that we need to date as the world should. I mean, that, that, because I went to a secular, uh, I went to University of Illinois right out of, right out of high school. And that was, that's, we should not emulate that at all. You know, just, I mean, it, a lot of them, they're not, they're just dating and they're having sex and they're just, whatever, playing around. So no, we should not do that. But I don't know if we should be to the point where it's like, I mean, it's, I don't know what it is. It's, it's dating on steroids. You know, I, I understand because we're serious. We don't want to play around. So I get that. But, you know, I think when, when, when younger, I mean, I look at myself when I was 18 and then compare myself when I was 22. There's a big difference between 18 and 22. So there's a lot of maturing that's going on in the college years. But, you know, the way that kind of we court and date, I tell my students at Moody, I was like, I'm not convinced that dating is the best way to get to know another person. I mean, if you think about it, think back when you, when you were younger and you were dating. What did you do? You know, ladies, you took maybe an extra hour to get ready. Guys, you maybe took a shower. So good thing. <laughs> Brush your teeth. So what, what did we do when we dated? We put our best me forward our best me forward. Is that then really getting to know that person like and all that? No, you're just getting to know their best them. I don't know how, what's the best way. I mean, I tell people actually what you need to do is watch when you're in groups and, and, and observe. I'm giving dating advice. I think this is so funny. As a single man, I'm giving this dating advice. And, <laughs> but I, I do, I, I tell my kids, you know, because I was like, well, I, I, the reason why I do is that because I've seen how it's been done wrong. But we've, we've really elevated singleness higher than it ought to be where marriage is like this pie in the sky. You know, you achieve that and you're gonna be so happy. And if you don't, then you kind of failed in life. I mean, we're, we all kind of already instilling kind of these ideas with our children. Think back when you were kids and teachers would read you fairy tales. How do all fairy tales end? Right, well first, they get married and then they live happily ever after, right? The end, I mean, it's like story after story, married, the end, married. Well, like, they will wonder why your kids are so confused about marriage, you know, that's like, you get married, no more story to tell you, you succeeded in life, the end. <laughs> You know, you don't get a 10-year checkup, 20-year checkup. Hopefully, they're still living happily ever after. You know, I mean, it's 2019. Hopefully, they're even married. But the real lesson is, it is not marriage that should bring you ultimate contentment. It is Lord Jesus Christ who should bring you ultimate contentment, whether you're married or whether you're single. And I'm not, all saying, I'm not at all saying that marriage is bad at all. I'm 49 years old. I'm a single man, and so I definitely have a burden to communicate the goodness of singleness, but also the goodness of marriage. I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I'm just reading scripture and seeing how both are saying both are good. And so we as a body of Christ need to lift up the beauty and gift of marriage. But let me tell you what I think we've done. We have done that at the expense of singleness. So now singleness at best is a consolation prize. I'm sorry you're single. You know, even singles in Christian community you might even know some. You know, you might have a good friend who's a Christian single. I bet we often feel sorry for them. Singles don't need our pity. They just need to be loved like the rest of us. 
they need to be shown that. Though they might not have a spouse or children of their own, you know what they have that's even greater than all that? That's even greater and better than sons and daughters, as Isaiah, as Isaiah says. It's being a child of God and being part of the family of God. So we have to recognize how these are both good. I had a friend in, uh, who was a missionary in China. She went into China young, and so she was not married. She was single. She was there for five years, and then she came back to the U.S., single. She hadn't seen several of her friends in a long time, and when she connected with them, they would all ask her similar questions like, tell me about China. What are your future ministry plans? And then get to personal things like, are you dating anyone? Do you have anyone special in your life? And each time she said, no, not yet. Do you know how some of her friends responded to her? Can I pray for you? <laughs> it was as if she had cancer. <laughs> Singleness is not cancer. Singleness is not a curse, but we often treat it like it is the unbearable burden. We need to look to the word of God to see what, God's, what, what God says about it. In, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about marriage and singleness. And in this chapter, he says that not only is singleness good, that it's actually a gift. It's a gift. Let me give you some advice for those of you in this room, though, that are not single. Don't keep reminding your single friends that this is a gift. <laughs> I actually know very few Christian singles that like that verse. Like, I've yet to meet anyone that's like, yeah, that's my life verse. Hallelujah, you know. First Corinthians 7 7, woohoo! <laughs> it's usually like the opposite. It's usually like, I don't know what Paul means here because it sure does not feel like a gift. You know, actually, what's the return policy on the gift? Still got the receipt? Like, can I give it back like a bad Christmas present? You know, re-gift it? I understand that. Obviously, singleness is difficult. It's not easy. There are challenges. But I've also heard from some people that marriage can also have some challenges. But with those challenges come blessings. In the same way, singleness has challenges, but there's also blessings. But why is it that we only focus on the enormous Blessings of marriage and the enormous challenges of singleness. See how this is, this is starkly inconsistent and unbiblical? I mean, we could all agree that marriage is a gift, and it is. It is a gift. But when it comes to singleness, we don't wholeheartedly agree with what Paul says when he calls this a gift. Most of the time, you know what people say instead? They don't say it's a gift. They say singleness, whew, it's a calling. It's a calling, you know what I mean? Like not anyone can be single. You have to be, you know, really, really special, super called to be Christian, like either Superman or Wonder Woman, which I don't know if you've noticed, but many of the superheroes are single. And the love interest is their weakness. You know what I mean? I mean, it's again, what are we teaching our kids? So much confusion, so much confusion. And the majority of my Christian friends are married. They're happily married. But they tell me, marriage can be difficult. Giving of yourselves, that's not easy. Loving unconditionally, that can be hard. Paul even goes on to say in Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church by giving up his life for her. So husbands, lay your life down for your wife. Amen, ladies? Amen, wives? You can kind of do this now. <laughs> so I don't know what husband that doesn't struggle with that nearly impossible calling of laying your life down. So actually, you know what I say tongue in cheek about marriage? I say marriage, whew, that's a calling, seriously. <laughs> you know, singleness, that's a gift. I don't have to lay my life down for anyone yet. But I'm not at all saying that marriage somehow is, you know, not as good as singleness, not at all. I'm just simply looking at the full counsel of God and recognizing that godly marriage and godly singleness are two sides of the same coin. Because I don't think we're ready to address this issue of sexuality and homosexuality until we redeem singleness. Because what I often hear over and over from people in the world and even in the church is it's unfair for God to expect my gay neighbor or my you know, gay loved one to not find a partner. That's unfair which is this underlying misunderstanding that somehow singleness is unfair. So we need to get this right 
If we're going to have a proper understanding of sexuality, we need to understand singleness as God understands it. Yes, the majority of people, the usual thing is that most people will marry. But not everyone will. As a matter of fact, Jesus in Matthew 22 says that there will be no marriage in heaven. So I hate to break the news to you, but we're going to be single in eternity. But the good news is that we corporately will be wed to the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen. So second, we need to be consistent regarding sexuality. What is God's standard when it comes to sexuality? Because I, I hear the logic that people often have. They say, well, God is not blessing homosexuality. The behavior is sin. The desires are sinful. The temptation is rooted in our sin nature. So that's not God's will. So because of that, Here's the logic. They say, because homosexuality is not God's will, therefore, heterosexuality must be God's will because that's our only option, homosexual or heterosexual. This is wrong, so this must be right. But let's think that through. Heterosexuality defined means being attracted to someone of the opposite sex or being sexually intimate with someone of the opposite sex. With that definition, there's a lot of things that can fall into that very broad definition. For example, I could be sleeping with half a dozen women, and that's heterosexual, right? I could be a married man, and I'm cheating on my wife with another woman, and that's also considered heterosexual. I could be an unmarried man, and I'm living with my girlfriend. We've actually been living together for several years, We even have a couple children together out of wedlock. That's also considered heterosexual, right? Those three scenarios that I gave you are all heterosexual, but sinful in God's eyes. God would never say, this is my standard when it includes sin, would he? He would never do that. This, like I said earlier, it's the right direction. It's too broad. We don't need a shotgun to communicate God's truth on sexuality. What we need is a laser. We need to show that God's communication of sexuality is crystal clear. Heterosexuality is too broad and actually it says nothing about how a single individual shall live. So if it's not heterosexuality, it's not homosexuality, then what is it? Holy sexuality. We need to take this paradigm, this paradigm of heterosexuality homosexuality, bisexuality, that is rooted in a secular worldview and set it aside. I always prefer a biblical framework over a secular framework. This framework is not rooted in Scripture. You you won't find the word heterosexual in Scripture. It's actually rooted in mid-18th century uh, German psychology, saying psychiatry, and they, what, when they created this term, they were not just creating uh, to describe the experience, but what they actually did was they created a new category of personhood. So this understanding of sexuality, we need to set it aside. It's not heterosexuality, it's not homosexuality, but it's holy sexuality. And what is holy sexuality? When I read through the full counsel of God, there's only two paths that God has laid out for us for how to live in relationship to our sexuality. First path is if you are not married yet and you are single, how do you live? Faithful to God. You live faithful to God by being sexually abstinent. If you are no longer single and you become married, How do you live faithful to God? And when I say married, I'm only using the definition that we see clearly laid out in Scripture, which is between one man and one woman. So if you are married, one man and woman, if you are married, then how do you live faithful to God in regards to your sexuality? You live faithful to God by being faithful to your spouse of the opposite sex. So holy sexuality is quite simply chastity in singleness or faithfulness in marriage. What I realized is there was no one term for both of those, so I created a term, and I call it holy sexuality. And what I like about that is this applies to everyone. doesn't matter if you're a man or woman. doesn't matter if you're young or old. doesn't matter if you have opposite sex attractions, same sex attractions, or both. We all need to pursue holiness. And note that I'm not saying two paths. I'm not saying two choices, I'm sorry, but I'm saying two paths. Why not two choices or two options? 
Because singleness actually is not a choice. Because if you think about it, I don't know anyone who was ever born married. We start out single, single, we are single by default. So it's two paths. And I'm not saying celibacy either. Because I, I think there's this kind of misunderstanding that, that, you know, celibacy is this lifelong chosen vocation that's, that's only rooted in Roman Catholic tradition. But that word celibacy is never found in the Bible. Very interesting. Celibacy has a Greek, uh, I'm sorry, it does not have a Greek root, it has a Latin root. But even when you look in the Latin Vulgate, which was translated right around the 4th and 5th century, you don't even find the word celibacy in the Latin Vulgate. It only appeared after in Roman Catholic tradition, and you kind of see where they're kind of embroiled in a lot of controversy now that, that I'd, I'd rather not get involved with. Celibacy, what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 7 is actually not celibacy. He's just talking about singleness, the state of singleness that that can change. You can get married. You know, people, we all start out single. Most people will marry. But if you think about it, even married couples who've been married, you know, good marriage for decades, in most cases, one goes home to be with the Lord before the other, leaving the other one behind as what? Single, widowed. By choice? Not by choice. And eventually, everyone will be single. So it's singleness, not uh, what we see. I'm not talking about this lifelong chosen vocation that is termed celibacy. I'm just talking about singleness, the state of singleness for myself. I call myself single. I don't call myself celibate because I don't know what tomorrow may bring. I'm open to getting married. I'm open to whatever God has for me. I just want to make sure that I'm in the center of the will of God. So holy sexuality is quite simply chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. You might think, okay, that's fine that there's these two paths, but then my gay friend only has one, one, you know, one option to be on this path, only one path to be single for the rest of their life. Not necessarily so. Because I believe in the sovereignty of God that he can do what the man thinks as impossible. Let me tell you the story about a friend of mine. He lived as a gay man for years. He came to Christ he stopped pursuing same-sex relationships. He was part of a great church that was like his family. He became really close friends with this young lady who was also a new believer. She came from a broken, broken past, nothing to do with sexuality or, or homosexuality, but she dated boys. She was sexually active. Unfortunately, she even have a, had a few abortions. Some of those relationships before she, became to, uh, before she became a Christian were a bit toxic, so when she came to Christ, she committed that she was not going to date. So the two of them felt really safe because he knew she didn't want to date and she knew he didn't like girls. So there wasn't that weirdness that often happened between a guy and a girl. They became best friends, no anxiety, no tension. After time, though, of being best friends, he began noticing some things about her that he hadn't noticed before, like her hair. She smelled good and she had curves. <laughs> he says, puberties are hard going through. Once try going through puberty twice. <laughs> <laughs> he got up enough courage, asked her out on a date, and after some dating, he asked her to marry him. And on their wedding night, he told his new bride, he said, honey, I cannot explain this. I'm not attracted to any other women. I'm only attracted to you. Holy sexuality is not something that we muster up on our own strength that we base upon our own sexual desires, holiness is a gift given by the Holy One. Holy sexuality, chastity and singleness, or faithfulness in marriage. Third, we need to be consistent regarding change. What does change look like? Because we think change means gay to straight. That would be change defined by Sigmund Freud. That would be changed defined by a secular framework. I think we should define change according to the way that the Bible defines change. Because if we think that change means gay to straight, or even some people say, well, if a person still is tempted in a certain way, for example, if there's a young lady, she's come out of a lesbian relationship, she comes to Christ, stops pursuing same-sex relationship, but she still has these temptations, but she doesn't act on it. 
would, she, would we tell her she hasn't been changed? Well, do we apply that same principle to any other sin struggle? Say I have a friend who was a drunk. He comes to Christ, stops drinking. But after years of sobriety, he admits he is still tempted to drink, but he doesn't. Would we tell him, you have not been changed? We need to lay some hands on you. You need some deliverance. I hope not. Because the manifestation of God's grace is more evident in his life because he says no to his flesh daily and says yes to Christ. So change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit-wrought ability. Spirit-wrought is a good old King James way of saying that it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's not empowered. It's not my own ability. I can't be holy. But it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. I love what John Piper said. He says that, like, we always think that grace is the forgiveness of sins, which it is, but, like, we limit it. Like, that, that's all it is. Grace is not just forgiveness of sins. It's the ability to go and sin no more. So he says that grace is not just pardon, it's power. It's that daily power we need to say no to our flesh and say yes to Christ. Change is not the absence of temptations. God doesn't promise you you won't be tempted, but it's a spirit wrought ability to be holy, even in the midst of temptations. And this is so important because we need to get this right. I think for a while, we have believed that somehow we can help people change their orientation. And then when they do, we celebrate when they lust after the opposite sex. And I know that sounds so weird to you, but I know that to be true in several cases where they celebrated when an individual who had unwanted same-sex attractions began lusting after the opposite sex, they celebrated. We should never celebrate sin. Lust is lust. But furthermore, I think for a while, what that has believed is if we can change that orientation, we treat this more like a disease and a disorder when it really is about sin. Because there's a difference. When you diagnose something incorrectly, you're gonna treat something incorrectly. Because when we diagnose something as a disorder, when really it's sin, we won't really treat the sin when we're trying to treat this. What do I mean by this? For a long time, we have thought that homosexuality, that the root causes are an absentee father, dominant mother, or abuse in one's childhood. Anyone hear something like that in the past? Like that's the root causes. I, I don't, I'm not saying that, that that could have an influence, that, that it could be a catalyst, but to say it's the root cause treated this more as a disorder or a disease and less as sin. We can't blame our sin struggle of today solely on our past on our upbringing or parenting. I actually know very few sins where we have placed the blame squarely on the parents. Any other sin, we know it's my fault that I sin. The Bible doesn't teach us that we're victims. It teaches us that we're sinners. And I know there's probably very likely people here in this room you may have a, a gay son, a lesbian daughter. Maybe you just have a prodigal. And you've spent nights up thinking, what could I have done better? I wish I would have just. And you're blaming yourself. Certainly, you could have been a perfect parent. But please hear me. Hear me clear carefully. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Perfect parenting does not guarantee perfect children. Look at Adam and Eve. Didn't they have a perfect father? Yes or no? <laughs> they did. Didn't they live in a perfect environment? Like we're like, oh, if I just had like the, you know, I just protect my kids and have the perfect environment, they'll turn out great. They lived in a perfect environment in the Garden of Eden. They still rebelled 
So what makes parents, do you think, that you can do a better job than God? I mean, you might even know people who, who were, you know, horrible parents. Like they were never home. They didn't spend any time. They didn't take their kids to church. They didn't do any like devotions. None of that. They didn't read the Bible to them. And the t- kids turned out great. Like they love Jesus. You're like, what? Unfair. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, we can all corporately say we don't like those people. <laughs> you might know some other people where... They did everything right. Or maybe you're that parent. You know, you're like, I gave up raises so I can stay at home with my family. Or you might be that mother and be like, I gave up my career so I could live at, you know, just stay at home to raise my kids. I did everything for my kids. And maybe one or two have walked away from God. You know what that tells? You know what that tells us? You're not God. If you could take a hardened heart and make it broken for God, that would make you God. And here's a little secret. Parents, you're not God. Only one person can save, and his name is Jesus. Amen? So here's something else that's very important. You know, this is the way I see it. I see that actually the main responsibility of a, of a Christian parent actually is not to produce godly children. You know why that's not your main, main responsibility? Because you can't do that. That's not, you can't actually create godly children. But you know what is your main job? Not to create godly children, but to be a godly parent. You can have control over that. You be godly and then let God be God. Amen. So for those of you that have put yourself in this prison of shame and guilt, it's not your fault. Be free. Yes, you could have done a lot of things better, but even if you did everything right, your kids are still sinners. Think about that, right? Your kids are still sinners. And so you just be godly. You pray. Yes, you pray that your kids can can be godly. I'm not saying you don't do that. I'm not saying that you don't do everything you can, that they will be godly. But at the end of the day, you can just be responsible for what you can be control of. You be godly yourself. You point your kids to Christ and then let God be God. I think that's so important because we need to be set free and recognize that the problem is sin and Jesus is the answer. Third, we need to be, so we need to be convicted, consistent. Third, we need to be compassionate. I've been teaching at Moody for almost a dozen years. Amazing. And every semester I have students that confide with me that they're wrestling with their sexuality. And many times they haven't told anyone. They haven't told their friends, haven't told their, their youth pastor, haven't told their parents. And because of that isolation, they often struggle with depression, even thoughts of suicide. That should move us. That we have believers who feel that, you know, we can share about any other sin struggle, but not share about this. So for some, this can be an issue between life and death. So how can we be more compassionate? Well, first, just expect that this is present here. Not be surprised. Because I still get that shock sometimes when people tell me that they've just found out their best friend that they grew up with confide with them that they have have same-sex attraction. They're like, how did that happen? They came from a good home. They had Christian parents. They were even homeschooled. (laughs) And I'm like, wait one second. Are you really saying that if someone comes from a good home, they have Christian parents, they even homeschooled, that they're somehow exempt from struggling with sin? Is that right? Okay, newsflash. I'm sensing in this room, and there's a big group of us here, I bet that there's probably maybe, maybe eight, nine, ten of you here that's struggling with sin. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass you or have you stand out, (laughs) right? Okay, let's be real. We're all wrestling with sin. I mean, we're all sinners. We all are tempted and we have our flesh even converted. We have still a sin nature. We still have that flesh that Paul talks about. I mean, what's what's the body of Christ? Are we a group of people who've got it all together, got our ducks in a row? 
we you know, meet once a week, we sing Kumbaya, is that what we are? Or is the body of Christ a group of people who know that we are broken and we need Christ? I'll just be honest with you, I am broken and I need Christ. Anyone else there, out there that, that can relate to that in any way? And so let us all hand in hand walk together to him. Not because I can fix you, I can't. Not because I have the answers, I don't. But I know someone who does. And his name is Jesus. So let us just quite simply find our solidarity in the fact that we all need Christ. I don't think that we need to be further segregated into our sin camps. You know, you know the liars are over here, you know, the whatever, the freaks are over here, and the, you know, whatever, you know, the drug addicts are over here, those who have sexual brokenness over here. No, I don't, we don't need any more segrega segregation in our churches today. What we need is more unity and how can we be united. I'm not saying that, you know, our sin struggles all look the same or feel the same or all are like exactly the same. No, there's going to be some differences. But at the end of the day, what I need most is not to find people that are struggling with the exact same thing that I'm struggling with. What I need is Christ and the body of Christ. I need the church to be the church. I need the diversity of the body of Christ. So we need to do that. Just expect that this is present here. Second, know your position. And what I'm talking about is not just it's bad, don't do it. It's true, but that doesn't help people in the time of need. Like when I say position, I'm talking about like what's the main takeaway for my message? It's not don't, you know, it, don't do it. My biggest takeaway is this. Like, let me tell you, my, my hope, like I said earlier, is that people would know Jesus and surrender to him. That's my main goal. I want people to not just know. Like, I know a lot of people like, oh, I know God. Well, that's fine, because the demons also know God. It's about following him without any hindrances in complete obedience. Jesus, when, he's, when he fully articulated what it meant to be a follower of Christ. You know what he said? He said, if anyone. Now, so you guys know, so in Greek, that word anyone, you know what it means? Anyone. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> so if anyone, if anyone would come after me, he or she must, so not an option, must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. You know what we want to do? We want to follow Jesus, but we want to skip over those first two things. We don't want to deny yourself. We don't want to pick up a cross daily. We just want to follow Jesus. You can't. Oh, but you might say, I pick up my cross every day. You know, you know I, it's this burden, you know, like uh, uh, I, I go into work and I, my boss is an atheist and he gives me a hard time. And so, you know, I carry my cross every day. That's not exactly what Jesus was talking about when he said, carry your cross. You know what the cross meant in ancient times, in first century? The cross was not this decorative piece that they would place on the mantle or on your wall. The cross represented the most gruesome form of death mankind has ever known. And Jesus is saying, pick that up and follow me. Following Jesus should cost us everything. If it hasn't, you're following the wrong Jesus. But although it'll cost you everything, it's worth it. It's worth it. So when we give up everything and he allows us to keep some things, we know those things are no longer ours, they're all his. Third, you may have a friend who you've always wondered whether they're wrestling with their sexuality, so you want to be there for them? You want to tell them, I, you know, I want to walk you with you through, I want to walk with you through this? So how would you ask them? Don't. <laughs> Imagine if someone came up to you out of the blue and asked, hey, um, do you have same-sex attractions? Awkward, just letting you know that's really awkward. But what you can do is give assurance of your friendship. Tell them, I thank God for you, and I just want you to know nothing can change my love, my friendship for you. You just created this safe space and invited them in it. Fourth, let's be a community that says no to the gay jokes and the bullying. There's nothing Christ-like about making fun of another person. And our kids can be cruel, so we need to be proactive in our youth. Kids love to say, you know, that's so gay, that's so gay. That shirt is so gay. A shirt can't be gay. Like, it's not possible that a shirt can be gay. <laughs> you know, how about help our kids to expand their vocabulary? You know, what a great idea. You know, learn more words. <laughs> 
Instead of saying that's so gay, how, okay, how about this? Instead of saying that's so gay, how about that's so Baptist or that's so Presbyterian or you know, something <laughs> really creative like that? So we need to be convicted, consistent, compassionate. Lastly, we need to be complete. When I say complete, I'm talking about what we say, what we communicate in our actions. When we communicate, we want to focus upon God's truth. Why? Because it's the truth that sets us free. So the question is, well, what is the truth when it comes to homosexuality? Oh, 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 that's easy. I got that. It's a sin. Anything more? No, 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 that's a sin. When that's all we say, you know what that's equivalent to? Giving someone a one spiritual law tract. You guys remember? How many of you guys remember the uh, gospel tracts? Remember that? The, anyone remember the four spiritual laws? Remember that? So it's funny because when I t- t- you know, talk to kids about that, they're like, what? You know? <laughs> gospel tracks, you know, you know, and I'd be like, you know, we used to have these little, you know, paper things. I'm like, okay, actually, we used to have something called paper, you know, <laughs> so gospel tracks. So not the four spiritual laws, it's the one spiritual law that goes something like this. You're a sinner and you're going to hell. Sorry. In case you didn't know, that's not good news, but think about it. That's the only message we've been giving to the gay community for the past several decades. You're a sinner, you're going to hell, there's no hope for you. It's no wonder why the gay community want nothing to do with us because we have not been giving them the good news at all. We've been telling them the bad news only. We're not telling them, and you know when you tell someone, uh, and we're not telling them the complete truth, we're telling them an incomplete truth. And when you tell someone an incomplete truth, that's just as harmful as telling someone a lie. So what is a complete truth? In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he lists 10 sins. And in this list of 10 sins are two Greek words that focus upon homosexual behavior. Sometimes people look at these verses and say, look, gays and lesbians won't inherit the kingdom of God. And when they do that, they conveniently forget about the eight other sins. Because if we look at all 10 sins, none of us should inherit the kingdom of God. Bad news. But I praise the Lord, Paul didn't stop there. And he goes on to say one of my favorite verses in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, where it says, such were. What, what tense is were? Past. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. Actually, that's not good news. That's amazing news. That is news that we can declare to anyone who needs to know about Jesus Christ. So our message, it has to be redemptive. It has to focus upon the good news. You know, our friends in the gay community, their main problem is actually not their sexuality. That's not their main problem. Their main problem is their need to fully surrender to Christ. You know, my biggest sin was not being in same-sex relationships. That was not my biggest sin. My biggest sin was unbelief. That is what separated me from God. So we need to make the most important thing the most important thing. I know because you're thinking, I have a gay neighbor. Like, how do I talk to them? As you wouldn't normally do. Hi, how are you? You know, how was your day? (laughs) You You know, well, when do I tell them? Tell them what? You know. I mean, would we, you know, if you have an unbelieving friend and you want them to know Jesus, would we like, when do I tell them that they're sinners? You know, I mean, you know, well, I mean, yes, part of the gospel is sharing that, the, that, that, but do we like zero in and tell them like, you're, you know, <laughs> you know, lay out all their sins, you know, you're sleeping in the grove and you're going to hell because of that or whatever. No, I mean, I think like, for example, if you have a Muslim friend, you know, are you like chomping at the bit? Like, when am I going to tell them? You know, you believe in a false prophet. For example, that's not a good thing to do. Okay, just don't do that. In the same way, if you have a gay friend, I'm not saying that you don't, that we're trying to sugarcoat this. But hear this. Morality will never save anyone. Like, let's just say we convince someone who's gay that being in a same-sex relationship is sinful. They're still lost. They're still lost. We need to make sure the main thing is the main thing. And what is that? They need to know about God and his son, Jesus. So let's talk about that first. Even if people are trying to force you into talking about morality, we can can go around that. 
So uh, we need to be redemptive. And how do we do that? And I'm going to give you some practical things here before we jump into the Q&A. I'm going over. Sorry about that. Uh, so let's first make sure that we differentiate between the two. You know how there's sheep and goats. You know, those are who believe in Christ and those who do not. So if there are Christians who are experiencing such attractions, how do we walk with them? That's one group. But how about these who do not know Christ, who identify as gay, or those who say, I'm a gay Christian, and it's okay. You know, would they be in the middle? Well, actually, they're holding to a false gospel. And if someone holds to a false gospel, what do we need to do? Share them the true gospel. We need to evangelize those, regardless of whether they think they're Christian or not. 70% of Americans, according to some surveys, say they're Christian. Wouldn't that be amazing if 70% of Americans were born-again believers? That would be amazing, but that's not the case. So let's start with Christians who experience same-sex attractions. Say after this weekend, you have a good friend that confides with you that they're wrestling with their sexuality. How would you respond? First thing, thank them. Thank them that they just trusted you with this really private, intimate matter. Don't freak out. Ask open-ended questions. Also ask, how does your faith fit into this? That could be one of the most important questions. How does your faith fit into this? What we want to hear is, my faith is strong, and I'm shaping my understanding of my sexuality and myself around my Christian faith. Unfortunately, what do we hear? The opposite. I'm shaping my faith around my sexuality. Second, tell them that they're not alone. In part of my doctoral research, I looked at sexuality on Christian college and campuses and, and, and students who have same-sex attractions are identified as gay and how there's this big stigma and they felt marginalized. And so how do we kind of reduce that while still holding to biblical truth? And one reality is many of these students, they would not open up because they felt like, and they felt all alone. So simply saying that I want to walk with you to Jesus, those words can be life for someone. Third, and this could be one of the most important points here, is we need to remind this individual and ourselves that our identity is in Christ, not in our work, not in our feelings, not in our hobbies, not in our sexuality. Because here's an important truth. I don't know of any other sin issue that we've conflated with who we are. If there's someone who's a liar, we know that that's not who they are, but what they do. A gossiper, that's not who they are, but what they do. An adulteress, that's not who she is, but what she does. And yet when it comes to sexuality, we have made sexuality who we are. If you have a gay friend and you ask them, when you say I'm gay, what do you mean by that? You can say, I know what you mean, but I want to hear your words. You will never hear them say, this is what I do. You won't hear them say, this is what I feel. You know what they'll say? This is who I am sexuality is not who we are, but how we are. There's a big difference. Sexuality is not who we are, but it's how we are. We cannot make our sexual desires or behaviors part of our essence. It's not. It's part of our experience. There's a big difference. And if we can help people to understand that, that's why when you have the wrong understanding of who you are, outflows from that wrong thinking, wrong uh, relationships, wrong ideas, wrong behavior. So identity is core. Fourth, be realistic. Don't give these false promises that if you just pray real hard, you could pray away the gay. Praying is important, but you don't pray so that you won't be tempted or won't be struggling. Praying and reading the Bible actually helps us that when temptations come, we can remain faithful to God. Fifth, don't focus so much on the externals, how people walk or talk. I mean, that's not as important as heart change. And I want to see the gospel change that comes from the inside out. Sixth, we need to really encourage God-honoring same-sex relationships in the body of Christ. What I need more than anything else is the, is the spiritual family. I need Christ in the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is the spiritual family. How the New Testament communicates intimate relationships and intimacy is through the family, the family of God. That is the core place where we receive our love and intimacy. Read, read through the Gospels. Actually, the most intimate relationships are between brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Corinthians 13, you know that whole chapter that we often hear read in, in weddings? Paul, when he wrote that, was not talking about weddings. Sure, we can apply that to husband and wife. But you know what that was applied to primarily? 
the church. So next time you walk into church, recite after yourself 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, and ask yourself, am I loving my brothers and sisters in Christ in that way? Because that is what we intend. And what I need is not intimacy found in a same-sex relationship, but what I need most is intimacy with Christ and intimacy with the body of Christ. So how do we share Christ with those in the gay community? Here's some things that we should not do. Do not compare this with an addiction, pedophilia, or murder. Just not a good way to win people to Christ. (laughs) Second, don't say lifestyle or choice. Christians, we use those words a lot. I never use those words as a gay man. You know why? I had the wrong identity. See how like identity distorts everything? Third, don't say love the sin or hate the sin. Just do it. Like when you tell someone, I love you, but I hate your sin, they don't feel loved. So just don't say that, just do it. <laughs> Fourth, don't feel that you always have to debate with people all the time. You know, people are like, well, I need to defend truth. Well, actually, look at the example of Jesus Christ. He was asked questions all the time. Most of the time, he didn't answer their question. Sometimes he was, one time he was silent. Sometimes he answered a question with a question. Other times he would give an answer, but it was an answer to another question. When someone asks you, do you think this is sin? We don't have to answer, I mean, we don't have to answer that because I know that what's more important than convincing them that this is sin is that I talk to them about Jesus Christ. And I'd rather deflect to that first than to talk about morality. You could just say, you know, I value our friendship more than debating all the time. Can we celebrate our similarities and tolerate our differences? Or you could say, I know you don't even believe in God, so why does it matter to you what God thinks? Actually, let's first talk about the existence of God and his son, Jesus. Because that is going to save them, not talking about morality. Yes, eventually we do talk, need to talk about God's ways and his truth, but we first need to point people to talk about God and his perfect ways. Uh, God and his son, we need to talk about that first. Uh, So what should you do? First, we need to pray. Pray and fast. How many of you guys have seen the movie War Room? You guys remember that? So that movie was written, produced by the Kendrick brothers. And the Kendrick brothers work with Chris Fabry to write, turn the movie into a book. The book and the movie came out at the same time. We got a copy of the book by by Tyndall House. We opened it up and Chris Fabry had dedicated that book to my mom. Do battle for people who are unable to stand in the gap for themselves. Second, we need to listen. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Third, be intentional. Don't be afraid to invite your gay neighbor over for dinner. I know then you're thinking, but if I do that, will will I be condoning their sin? And that's a great question. But last time I checked, we usually have sinners over for dinner, right? I mean, nothing new. You're just eating with them. You're not sinning with them. There's a big difference. (laughs) Fourth, you need to be patient and persistent. It's going to take time for people to turn around. Like for me to turn around in eight years, actually, I believe is a short time. I know people who've been praying for decades. Lastly, be transparent. Talk about what God has done in your life lately. If you're a follower of Christ, you should not be the same as you were 10 years years ago, 10 months ago, or even 10 weeks ago. Keep talking about that. You know, don't be afraid to share about your doubts and fears. Just be real. I would never have considered the gospel if I didn't see the gospel lived out in my parents' lives. You need to live the gospel before you preach the gospel. I wouldn't have picked up the Bible from the trash. Remember that? If I didn't see the Bible lived out in my mother's life and my father's life. I didn't leave pursuing same-sex relationships because my parents convinced me they were sinful. No. I left it because they showed me something better. And his name It's Jesus. Our job as followers of Christ is to show a dying world out there that no matter what they're clinging to, all the fool's gold in the world, job, career, money, family, spouse, children, no matter what they're holding on to, not only is Jesus better than all of that, but following Jesus is best. So may we simply live our lives in a way that it is unmistakable that not only is following Jesus better, but it is best. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that you have given us your son, Jesus. Help us, God, to live authentically in a way that people will come to know you and your son. We praise you and we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank Christopher for his time this evening. Thank you, buddy. Well, we are going to do our best to take a few questions because we promised that this morning. Uh, we are going to go no later than 740 at request of our children's workers who have the children locked in room and key right now. So, um, so we will take some questions. I have the iPad up here so you can text at any time to this number and those questions will come here if you would prefer that. I will read some of those questions that come in. Mark has a microphone as does Pastor Steve. So simply raise your hand and they will come to you with the microphone and you can ask it out loud. That would be great as well. Uh, how, this isn't exactly homosexuality, how can I talk to a friend who their daughter identifies as transgender? And he's a believer. So uh, the person who's transgender is a believer? No, no the, the, your, your friend who has the son. He's, who's, yeah. Um, you know, in the same way, this person, their, their biggest problem, you know, just as you know, I'm saying with our our gay friends is not their sexuality. So this person, their main problem isn't their misunderstanding of sex and gender, but the main problem is they fully need to surrender to Christ. So kind of focusing on that first. Um, the issue with transgenderism, we seem like it's, it's throwing us for a loop. How do we handle this? Um, it's, it stems from postmodernism and specifically Michael Foucault, a French philosopher who, uh, who came up, and, and he's gay, died of AIDS. He, his idea was the eradication of binaries. He saw a lot of the oppression of you know, different people groups of you know, minorities, and so instead of kind of uh, focusing on liberation philosophy, he focused upon something beyond that, Instead of saying, you know, the minorities, you need to kind of, you know, be liberated and overcome the majorities by empowering them, he basically did it more in a philosophical sense. And he said, this binary system between uh, black and white, uh, you know, poor and rich, or uh, female and male, uh, gay and straight, these are all social constructs. All binaries are social constructs, and we just need to do away with them. So therefore, there's no such thing as black and white. There's no such thing as male, female. There's no such thing as gay, straight. It's all a social construct. So really, the real issue of transgenderism is not what is male or female. The real issue is what is true and what is real. The world says, if you think something, if you feel something, it's true. Right? Isn't that the world says? You know, if you think you can be, you know, a professional football player, even though you're five foot two, you can do it, right? I mean, isn't that the world says? Don't, don't let anyone tell you you can't do that, right? I mean, even though everything is saying you can't, but you can do it. What does God's word say? The heart is deceitful above all else, Jeremiah 17, 9. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I can't trust my mind. I can't trust my heart, but I can trust Christ. I can trust his word. The real issue here, when it comes to uh, transgenderism, what is true and what is right, and because the truth and right has been so distorted and become subjective, it's interesting because our friends who are in the world, they say, I believe in science. Well, great. Then why is it when it comes to transgenderism, why is it that we take one science and make it negate another. What do I mean by this? Why is it that psychology now trumps biology? Biology is one of the most objective scientists. Anyone like study science or biology? It's basically you just observe. There's, there's not that much theory in that. You know, when you get to chemistry and, and physics and stuff, there's more you know, th theoretical issues. Biology, you just observe something. Psychology is also a bit more subjective, but we put our psychology over our biology where biology is completely obsolete and doesn't matter. I have one that was 
Then this uh, several people asked, as a believer, should I attend a gay marriage? Mm. And if I do, am I giving a hearty approval to that union? One of the hardest questions uh, that I'm asked more, most often today. You know, it's interesting. Ten years ago, that was not a very common question. Uh, Twenty years ago, it was not really a question at all. I think in ten years from now, that's going to be something that I think all believers will have to face. It's our world. The Obergefell decision in 2015, the Supreme Court decision, um, it's a watershed moment that, that has changed the course of history, you know, and, and we're not turning back, unfortunately. There's, it can really, unfortunately, be a make or break decision, uh, especially in the family, especially if you're a son or, you know, if you're son or daughter or maybe your brother or sister, you know, where they say, if you don't go, that's the end of our relationship. So there are two important things that, that are at stake. First, does our loved one know what we believe? Not simply that this is sin, but that we believe in a mighty God. We believe that God's word is inerrant and perfect and that we believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Do, we, do they know what we believe, but also do they know that we still love them? Because if you don't go, boy, it's clear what you believe, but it could be misunderstood that you love them. If you do go, it's clear you love them, but it could be misunderstood what you believe. So the two can be in tension. So does your presence, does that, does that mean that you are there to celebrate and that you agree with it. In most situations, yes, but not always. For example, in-laws will sometimes go to weddings and they don't always approve, but they're there. <laughs> However, I'm not then saying that you need to go because we need to also think it through because what's the purpose of a wedding? I mean, actually a Christian wedding, it should not be, a Christian wedding should not all be about the bride. It should be about Christ and the church. So actually, a wedding should be, yes, two people coming together, but it's before God and who else? The church. So therefore, if I'm attending a wedding, I'm there not just to attend, but I'm there to be a witness to the union of two people. And actually, our job also is to hold them to their covenant and be around them to help them to be faithful to that covenant. Amen? I mean, that's actually the whole purpose of why we come together. So... And looking through scripture, God has a lot of emphasis on marriage and weddings. The Bible begins with a marriage, Genesis 2. The Bible ends with a wedding, Genesis, Revelation 20. And throughout, from beginning to end, in the Old Testament, Yahweh is, is the faithful groom, faithful husband to a, an adulterous Israel. In the New Testament, we have Jesus now, who is the groom to the church, so if the Bible is communicating a lot of theology through the metaphor of marriage, we should not trivialize marriage. So I personally would have a hard time going to the ceremony. However, I think you know, as a parent, it, you, know, you can go to the reception. You know, I mean, it's a free dinner, so why not? You know? <laughs> go to the dinner. Because I mean, I see that as a little bit of a difference. Um, that you're there for the dinner, but not the actual ceremony. That could be a way to communicate. You know, you could be there, or you could just be there for the whole weekend, maybe not go to either. So, I mean, I, I, I'm saying you need to pray and fast and let God do, because there's more options than just not going at all or going to everything. I think that you can communicate, you know, because we have to be full of grace and full of truth. Um, through Maybe at the reception, um, there are things that I wouldn't participate in. I wouldn't do the toast. To, you know, when people are like, to the couple. Well, I wouldn't be able to say to the couple. Um, going through the line, congratulations. I wouldn't be able to say congratulations. I could say, I love you. I get, I'm so glad I get to be a part of your life. Um, instead of getting them one gift for the couple, I would differentiate that to two separate gifts for the individuals. How, how are we able to you know, celebrate the individual, not the couple? Get them a gift that has maybe some Christian meaning. Get them my book. Maybe they might read it. God, <laughs> God could use that. You never know. <laughs> so on that, you have several people that are asking questions about how to speak then to a gay friend or a gay person, maybe giving them a book or something that would help them. Are there Bible verses that you would recommend, especially if they come and say, I can justify this biblically. Yeah. Uh, you have several people saying, well, how do I come back to them uh, well with a biblical answer or biblical resources? Yeah. Um, so if, if someone, you know, I know parents who 
would uh, want to give their gay son or daughter a book. Uh, I know sometimes parents will, don't say, I have a book for you to read. That really never works. Um, but you could say, I read this book and I would love your opinion on it. That's a two-way street where you're asking for information as opposed to just giving information. So that's one way that can work. But if someone is coming to you and say, look, here's a book by Matthew Vines or here's a book by Justin Lee where they say it's okay or James Bronson. Those are like, well, also David Gushy. Those are the kind of four. Uh, Matthew Vines is the one that wrote God and the Gay Christian. You don't have to read that book. Um, Christianity Today asked me to re review that. Just go online and that's, it's, it's a very popular, readable book that many people are going to. Justin Lee is, uh, wrote that book before. Both of them are gay Christians. Uh, Justin Lee wrote a book called Torn. It's not as uh, well-written as Matthew Vines, uh, but Matthew Vines rely heavily on James Bronson, who does a more academic version, but he changed his mind because his son came out, and that kind of caused him to change his mind. Another, uh, David Gushy is another guy who's written a book. Um, uh, he uh, is a self-proclaimed uh, um, he, he says he's the highest authority on et Christian ethics. When someone kind of says that about themselves, I'm a little, <laughs> little bit skeptical. Um, uh, but his, his book is read a little bit, but I, I think he does, his, his um, is not, is kind of, is very obviously sloppy hermeneutics. It's all sloppy hermeneutics, but it's, it's like kind of in your face sloppy hermeneutics. J James Bronson is one that we need to, I think, deal with, uh, that a lot of people have already dealt with well. But I would say if, um, unless you're really, really well versed in this, I don't think you need to kind of go back and forth with this. I think ultimately it comes down to this. Is God's word perfect or not? Are there errors in God's word. I really don't know anyone. Matthew Vines claims that he has a high view of scripture, but it's interesting, everyone he quotes has a low view of scripture. The arguments that they make often have a low view of the Old Testament. I think a good question is, is, does the Old Testament, is the Old Testament perfect or are there errors in the Old Testament? And almost, I would say, almost they would all say, no, there, there are things that we don't hold to. Well, that, that just shows that they don't really understand why there are things in the Old Testament that we don't follow anymore. It's not that the Old Testament has been eradicated or there are errors. It's simply because, as the New Testament communicated, that there are things that in the Old Testament that have been fulfilled in Christ. Not abolished. Christ clearly communicates that. They've not been abolished. They've been fulfilled in Christ. Um, and uh, so, uh, or, or Paul says that. So we need to really uh, help people, you know, is the Old Testament, you know, is it true or not? Focus on that's the primary issue. Uh, and what is the gospel? Because most of those that I know uh, that have become gay affirming, their understanding of the gospel has become more the social gospel. Because let's just set aside that this is sin. If this is sin, let's just say for argument's sake, this is not sin, our gay friends still need to surrender to Christ. Like that, that is always, we always need to surrender to Christ. And so I say focus on that. If you want to focus on any passage, I would focus upon two parallel passages. It's Mark chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 19. That to, to me is one of the strongest apologetics for marriage between one man and one woman. Jesus Christ was questioned by the Pharisees about divorce. And his response to them was, in the beginning, the creator made them male and female, and the two shall become one flesh. All Jesus needed to do if he wanted to simply refute divorce was to quote from Genesis 2, which was, the two shall become one. That's all he needed to say. But Jesus said more, as he always does. David Gushy got this wrong and said, well, Jesus was only questioned about divorce, so he's only limited to that. Whenever is Jesus limited by the questioner? Never, <laughs> never. I mean, I thought that was the worst answer by someone who says they're the, they're the world's highest ethicist. So we need to realize that, that, that actually Jesus never, and he uses opportunities to school us on misunderstandings. 
And Jesus, the reason why he said that the creator made the male and female, the two shall become one flesh, because the creator made the male and female, that's from Genesis 1.27, the two shall become one flesh is from Genesis 2.24. He puts those two together because, though he was asked about divorce, he not only refuted divorce, but he also was teaching about marriage, that the only definition of marriage is between one man and one woman. Anything other than that, is not marriage. And those are Jesus' words. So I would go to that as, in my mind, the strongest uh, apologetic for uh, why that is. Hi, I have a specific situation. Sure. Uh, Three women, I'm one of them, meet every week. We read through the Bible. Great. And we have a discussion group. So a fourth person showed up last week and brought her same-sex married son with her to our women's group. Okay, so we were a little taken aback, but we welcomed him and loved him and and talked scripture as if, you know. Just as you did before. Just as we did before. Yes. He is interested in the gospel. Great. And we set him on a reading plan and started him with the gospels. And he's reading them, and he texted me and said he's, he's reading, and he cried all the way through Matthew, he said. Wow. So we were just how kind old? of... How old? He's probably 32, maybe. Mm-hmm. And his partner is not interested, but he is interested. Mm. So we, uh, we sought counsel and prayed about it and thought, well, this is a women's group. So we got a little testy about that. But then we decided that God was at work here. Mm. And so he's welcome to come back. He's going to come back on Tuesday. And we just want to handle the situation with love and truth and honesty and compassion. And I just wondered if you had a few words for us. Um, What I know what direction we need to go, but any specifics for loving this man and, um, you know, well, I mean, the fact that he came and, and his mother is, is a follower of Christ. He's a follower of Christ, yes. Uh, I would, because it, it's, it's likely that the mother might have spoken with him and shared the gospel with him, but, you know, there's something about sometimes family members that do that that when you just don't hear, especially your mom. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I would suggest maybe that you three that are not his mom, Thank but, you, you know, much. someone that is kind of a new friend, uh, just sh- lay out the gospel in... in um, and, and maybe, you know, just practice that in a way to just something that we want to be able to concisely say it, not oversimplify it, but concisely say that in a way to, to articulate what that is. Um, and there's different ways that you can do that um, that can help you to share the important things um, and, and some resources, I'm sure, that, that here that, that you guys have that, that can do that. They, the gospel tracks, you know, you can do the four spiritual laws, you can do evangel- evangelism explosion, kind of the, the five things. Um, you know, it's, uh, um, heaven is a free gift. Uh, we're all sinners. Uh, God is perfect, just, and perfect love. Jesus is, came to, you know, to save us, and then we need faith. Something like that, you know, where you'd explain that. I mean, of course, you didn't do, wouldn't do it that fast, but be able to articulate the gospel. <laughs> And, and ask them if they want to, you know, put their faith in Christ today. I, I would use that advantage. I would, that's a, but that's a starting point. But then I would say that you guys would, you know, walk with them, but bring in some godly men that can also walk with you guys. I mean, so he trusts you so far, um, but uh, share the gospel, but bring maybe, uh, you know, some other a, a godly man, elder, you know, a pastor of this church or someone, other church leader <clears throat> that can walk with you guys. What's that? There. Good. Yeah, great. Yeah, I would even kind of just lay that all out because what that, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. I mean, I, I, I you know, explain what that means. 
We all need the gospel, right? Amen. Every single one of us. And today we've heard about the faithfulness of God once again. So thank you for equipping us. This has been fantastic. We got over 50 questions okay. texted. So we for sure didn't get to all of those. So maybe there's a way that we could even talk about doing something online. Mm-hmm. We could yep. answer more of those questions. And I'll questions. be even outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll be outside. There will be some books available for you for you, them today in the lower lobby and upper lobby, mm-hmm. we believe. So you can go grab one of those books. But we had several people text in and say how grateful they were for you. Mm. Several people say that they're praying for you mm. and for your Thanks, health. Thank people you. saying that they're praying for your mom and your dad. Amen. So I thought we should close by praying for you. Amen. Right? Thank you. Appreciate Let that. Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this man. This is a special, special man. And a man who has seen the beauty of brokenness, mm. but more so seen the power of the gospel in his own life, seen the power of the gospel for his parents' life, And God, you're using him to bring the gospel to people all around the world. I pray that you will continue to use him in great and mighty ways, whether it be on the internet or live in person, wherever his writing goes, or whether it's in an e-reader or in print. God, will you use it to help people know the power of the gospel and the transformation we can have in Christ? Lord, we need you, and we need the gospel. And so we thank you for giving us that sweet reminder again tonight. Lord, we love this man, and we send him back out to continue his ministry. We thank you for bringing him to us for a period of time. But use him as he goes away from us. Use him mightily as he returns home. And use him in the students' lives that he's teaching at Moody. We love you, Father. It's in the name of Christ we pray.